Hey everybody, welcome back to the Modern Customer Podcast. I'm your host, Blake Morgan. Today my guest is Ted Moser, who's a senior partner at Profit. Profit is a growth and transformation strategy where he helps leading data and software enable companies to anticipate market evolution, craft distinctive platform growth strategies, and realize their ambitions. Today, we are talking about his new book, Winning Through Platforms, How to Succeed When Every Competitor Has One. And we're talking about what actually is a customer experience technology stack. So you'll be hearing about data, insights, and how it all works together to build a robust customer strategy. Please enjoy Ted Moser. Hey, Ted, welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast. Are you in the Bay Area today? I am, Blake. I'm in the Bay Area. Pleasure to be here. For our audience that don't know you and don't know Profit, let's just hear the, the high level of how you came to be in this role at Profit. Profit is a growth consultancy. So we have a mission to help our clients achieve what we call uncommon growth. I'm a senior partner there. I work with tech clients and clients for whom technology is becoming a big part of their business if they weren't born tech. The Profit Company is about 600 folks around the world. We help clients with growth strategies and then cascade those down into innovation they need to make at the business model and portfolio offer level, then branding, go-to-market excellence, and then organization and operating models for growth. So we're really helping our clients create integrated growth programs that accelerate their rate of growth. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you heard, you said operations for me, my ears always perk up when I hear that, because that's a big part of customer experience. <laughs> How much of your work is around customer strategy and, and, and anything with the word customer in it for your clients? About a hundred percent of all projects have the word customer in them. Yeah, good. <laughs> um, what inspired me to you know, write the book that I recently wrote around winning through platforms was the reach the platforms into the customer use journey. Uh, we talk about how digital really lit the customer choose journey at the turn of the century through websites. We could watch the customer go shopping. We could talk to them as they were making their decisions through our website and hopefully earn their choice. What's radical and really life-changing about platforms is once we were able to stay with the customer through hosted software as they begin to use what it is they bought, we were with them for the full journey at that point. And so winning through platforms is all around bringing new disciplines into that use journey and making what was maybe more sporadic customer experience efforts, much more systematic, much more operational in nature. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. When you broach a subject of customer experience with your clients, like what are they talking about mostly? Is it the technology strategy for customers, like customer journey? It is how the customer is experiencing the brand throughout their journey. Tech is needed, but we start with the human being and understand what they're experiencing throughout. We used to have to check in with the customer through research because companies weren't connected to their customers as they drove their car, as they wore a pair of running shoes, as they used their oven, as they slept on a mattress. But now with sensors and interactive software, as the customer is going through their journey, I'm there with them as the company. I'm able to watch what it is they're cooking. I'm able to watch their sleep patterns at night and how their temperature is changing and change the mattress to make it firmer or less or cooler or hotter or change the angle. To, and what's happening is because I'm with the customer, as they're using what it is that they've acquired from me, my whole experience with them of a product becomes an always on service of some sort of value added. And then with AI coming in, increasingly it's an intelligent service. That's um, all the more figuring out what the right thing to do for the customer is in the next moment. So I think customer experience is going from moments of signature experience, you know, these peaky moments, the spiky moments, that at this moment I'm gonna wow the customer. There's still a lot of value in that. 
but it's becoming an always on digital wow throughout their experience. And, and if that can become more systematic, it really changes the value that a company can add to the customer through experience. So let's just talk about your book a little bit. The When it was sent to me, I was interested in this idea of platforms that, yeah, I mean, platforms are so important and increasingly every company is a tech company. What are some of the main ideas of your book in, in how to win with a platform? Let's say if you're a brand and you want to either get started or improve what you're doing. The idea was that this is not a very old discipline. The whole business community is fairly immature in understanding how to win through platforms. The reason why is because until smartphones were invented around 2008, 2009, thanks to Apple and Samsung, and until cloud hosted services were available from people like Amazon or Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud Platform, until that was available, I couldn't watch the customer use what it is that they had acquired from me. And so the 2010s were the go-go years of platforms, about 16,000 new companies backed by risk capital entered the market, started to disrupt market after market from the incumbents. In the latter part of the 2010s, we saw the incumbents strike back. They go, I get this game. I understand I need to do this as well. And so what's really happening now in the 2020s is a mainstream market where in many markets, every competitor is starting to use a platform approach, making the investments that they need. And the question that the book raises is, how do I win when every competitor has one? That's the subtitle of the book. So it's really a competitive strategy book for a platform era. Most of us that went to business school and learned about competitive strategy, we're really learning about product line strategy. And platform strategy is different. The rules of how you win are different. And I didn't think there was a book out there that laid out what those rules were. So we've done this as a playbook. There are 24 ways to win in the book, 24 plays, almost like a sports team has a play. They're organized by types of plays. Some of them are around strategic advantage, how to build a portfolio of businesses that are powered by a platform, how to design a platform. Some of the plays are growth oriented, how to accelerate my growth, how to innovate on customer experiences through my platform. And then some of the plays are internal to my company, how to organize to do platform business well, because the platform connects people within the company together. It makes their decisions interdependent in a way that they weren't interdependent before. So you sort of have to dance together in a new way as a platform business. So the reason we did this in play by play is you can choose the plays that look like the ones that will bring your company progress. If you're already a platform company, you don't have to start with the first play. You can say, you know, one of these plays for demand acceleration or one of these for experience innovation are the plays we need to make and sort of choose your own adventure. Let me stop if you there. Let me stop you please. there. Ted, what, when you say platform, like what does that mean to you? We try to use a simple definition. We try to say a platform is the underlying tech stack that enables you to observe your customer as they're using what it is that they've acquired from you and add value to them during use. Then if you're doing your job well, you will be collecting data along the way, first party data, that then the next time the customer goes to choose on their next shopping trip, you're an advantaged player because you have insight as to what's driving their behavior. You have insight as to what their priorities are and you'd be in the best position to make the next best offer to the customer. So platforms have a role of both creating new value throughout the use journey and then giving you advantage when the customer is next making a choice. They need to connect back to my pre-purchase platforms, my digital marketing tech stack, my e-commerce tech stack, but they might not be sold through digital. They might be sold through other channels, but then again, I could be with the customer digitally. If we think of Sleep Number, who sells a mattress that is full of sensors, or if we think of your latest automobile purchase, you know, you're not buying it through an e-commerce channel necessarily, but you're buying a product that once you take it home and start to use it is always on and connected to you and able to observe and add value 
you know, progressive insurance says, hey, if you let me watch you drive, I'll give you a lower insurance rate. Uh, but it's because I get to watch you yeah. and see if you're a safe driver as you're driving. So this idea of visibility for value is really at the heart of the platform movement. And I think getting that balance right is what companies need to do, as well as getting their operations to execute well. So if I were to say, Ted, what does a customer experience technology stack look like to you? How would you answer that question? Well, in a platform world, I often have a single sign on. Right. Part of my tech stack is now my own platform I may offer. I'm probably outsourcing some of that to a third party cloud service provider who's giving me the basics. And then I might have part of it that's my internal proprietary tech stack. I'm, I have some sort of data models around the customer, what it is they're doing. And I have algorithms usually that are analyzing what the customer is trying to get done and figure out what I should be offering them in some form of digital dialogue where I'm asking them how I can help or suggesting what they want to do next. So if I'm Nike and I sell a pair of sneakers, Nike hasn't yet chosen to put sensors on the bottom of its shoes. Right. People are experimenting with electronic insoles, but even wearing some form of a exercise band or an Apple Watch or something that keeps me connected through Bluetooth, Nike can watch me run if I'm logged into the account. And Nike makes it worth my while because it gives me digital runs that I can enjoy. It connects me to running communities where I can find encouragement from others. It helps me keep track of my fitness and how well I'm exercising. Yeah. So Nike has a, a, a run community, exercise community, sneaker collection community. And it found that if anyone belongs to more than two communities, they have a 4X lifetime value with Nike than if they don't belong to the communities, if they're not involved in some form of a platform relationship. So it's being able to be observed and, and have that value felt that really creates the momentum of the platform. And it's all up to the company's marketing, customer experience and strategic creativity to make itself a winner. The technology's there. What, what then differentiates one company from the next is strategic creativity, and then internal coordination. One of the things I noticed you did not mention is the contact center. So I'm just curious, are you more selling into customer insights and marketing and like sales, or does the contact center and customer service really play into this platform that you're talking about? Customer success and a customer contact center definitely has a role. There's a spectrum, you know, what's the role that chat plays? What's the role that algorithmic uh, plays? What's the role that new generative AI plays? And what's the role that a human conversation plays in a chat center? So I think there's a whole spectrum and they all fit into my strategy for the use journey and what I want the customer to experience. So I didn't mention it, but I it wasn't you know intentional. It's, it's an integral part of the, it's really the use journey mix that I'm deciding, you know, what, what mix of channels will really best serve the customer in what journey moments. Communities are other ways that customers can be served. If my company is catalyzing a community of users that talk to each other, they can also be the equivalent of a call center, but through crowdsourcing, answer each other's questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of what you're talking about is the technology side. I'm curious, like with your practitioners that you work with, with technology changing so rapidly, things so fluid, <clears throat> what are the ways that your clients are keeping up? You know, these businesses are big. They move slowly. They have to move more quickly yes. now with technology. So what they advice do. do you have for them so they can keep up without rushing and having shiny object syndrome? A couple of things. One is companies need to think of a new source of synergy as our data synergies. If I, let's say take Disney. The way that Disney uses platforms to connect its business from the characters in the park to the media business to the merchandise business is really interesting. Disney sort of has two platforms. One is the magic band as I walk through the park or my cell phone if I'm 
tied into a Disney app that's open. That's enhancing my hotel and park journey, as well as collecting data as to what I care about as a consumer. Meanwhile, obviously, Disney Plus is let is letting Disney observe me watching uh, Disney media. Those two sources of information then inform the merchandise business, which used to be a street corner business. Now it's become an e-commerce business. But what's interesting is the way that the offers of merchandise are now being integrated into what Disney's learning about me as a customer across my park and my media experiences. So I might on the back end of a Disney media experience be offered merchandise that's unique to the show that I just watched and can only be purchased at that point in time. And you're beginning to see this data synergy across the Disney experience. So I think companies, back to your question about avoiding the shiny object, they really need to first figure out what data flows will give them superior customer experiences and superior customer insight throughout the use journey. And then if you work backwards from that, you get to data architecture. And then if you work back from that, you get to tech stack. But starting with tech stack and the latest speeds and feeds of some new layer in my tech stack, it's probably not the right starting point. It's probably not the right springboard, mm -hmm. but customer understanding and data strategy is. If you were if you were to advise a practitioner, Ted, and you gave them a shopping cart and you sent them into a store and they were really starting yes. from square one and they had to put all the technologies and the software in their cart to run a beautiful customer data program and customer experience software program, tech stack, what would you tell them to put in their cart? Are there a couple things that they would need? Well, a good customer success package would be important. I think being able to measure whether the customer is using my product, whether it's using all of its features. Often platforms are, are multi-module in the B2B world. They're multi-module platforms and the customer might only be using one. And within that one, it might not be using all the features they could. So understanding what value the customer is getting from what it is to subscribe to, if it's a subscription business or even if it's not, what value they're getting from being on the platform is critical because I've really got two goals. I have the goal of acquiring new customers, of turning strangers into customers for the first time. And then I have the goal of taking new customers and growing their lifetime value. I would start with customer success because that's the first step in making sure I can grow that lifetime value. And then the digital product or service itself that the, cus that the customer is using becomes another part of my tech stack. So I have to have my digital product or service teams interacting with my marketing and customer value growth teams in a new way that they didn't have to interact before. Before the, the product management teams and the marketing teams could sort of throw things over the wall together. In this world, they're, they're running on the same customer interaction and they both are watching for their own purposes. So I think I'd want great customer success software. I'd probably then turn to my digital product and service architecture and learn how to turn that into what looks like a data collection tool that looks more like a digital marketing tool, but it's all around building customer momentum and understanding how to grow customer value. Do you think customer success is a term that any industry can use, or is that mostly for like B2B software subscription companies? Like let's say a trucking company, a logistics company, a company that sells canned soup, customer success, is that for everyone? Yep. Okay. What does it mean to you? For, for me, I think you're raising the point of, I think how easy is it to watch my customer? If I'm selling canned soup, it, it gets harder, number one because I want to have sensors on my spoon and I want to have sensors on my lid of my can. But what I will have going forward, if you look at what higher the appliance makers done, there's now a barcode reader in the refrigerator. And most of my products have a barcode. And so what I can do is look up on a cell phone now and say, what's in the fridge? How close are they to the expiration date? AI can tell me what meals can I make for dinner tonight out of what I have? And do I need to ask my supermarket to deliver something 
so that by the time I get home, it's there that I can make the meal I want. So even if I'm not a, put a sensor on a company, I might get new insights based on someone else's platform. If I'm a yogurt maker, I can watch the pots of yogurt leave one at a time from the fridge. If I'm tying into a new data service, it's not the one that I've been relying on. I've been relying on the supermarket's checkout data service to go, when did they buy and what did they buy? What platform world is going to let me ask is, when did they use and what did they use? And that insight is actually possibly more valuable than the purchase insight. Because if I find that the yogurt's disappearing at twice the velocity of what else is in the fridge, it raises new questions of how do I then think about serving that customer better if they're running out of yogurt before they go on their next shopping trip. So I think there's all sorts of new opportunities. I would bet in five years, 10 years, somebody's going to offer to geofence the kitchens of a of a, at least medium income family and up. Probably it'll be Amazon. But as you could imagine, if I can watch you pull food out of the pantry as well, back to the canned tomatoes, they may not be sitting in the fridge, but they may be sitting in a drawer. And the old question is, what's the value you'll bring me if I give you visibility into what's in my kitchen pantry? Yeah, and I think that's the kind one, of world we're going to be like, moving I to. I really wouldn't want Amazon. I already feel a little nervous with some of these technologies in my house that they're listening. I, I wonder, would you have trouble? I that's mean, that's right, a Blake. pretty big you know, security. That, that's a yes. lot of trust the customer has to have. With so many data breaches and security issues, I don't, I just, I'm not sure if that one's going to happen. You're right. I, you're so, you're, you're right to be skeptical, first of all. A certain part of the book we talk about plays around giving the customer a better data deal as one of your growth moves. What would it take in terms of value for the customer to allow visibility? And there are other parts of the book we talk around the culture of mutualism, of not being a parasite if you're there able to watch, but being somebody who's doing things for the customer proactively to create win-win value. And the customer is going to figure out the ethos of its company. This whole platform world puts data privacy and data ethics and company culture expressed through what they're doing with data at the heart of the customer relationship. To your point, if, if you and I are saying something and all of a sudden we get creepy ads or if we start to go shopping for an airline ticket and all of a sudden the airline price goes up, uh, we worry that the companies are using visibility against us rather than for us. And so I think one of the at the heart of the platform conversation is, am I willing to honestly deliver value through ethical relationships with my customer for visibility? If not, they won't give me the visibility and I won't get the chance to to play, if you will, from a business perspective. Yeah, I mean, it seems like this will be the year of data insights. A lot of people are talking about it, actually getting really good data insights. So I think that's a really interesting note to wrap on. But I wanted to get to know you a little bit doing some rapid fire. Does that sound fun? Please, love to. Okay, perfect. All right, Ted, while you are a tech person, I assume you're streaming shows. What's the last great show that you streamed? Um, I, I have to say I'm a... Fanatical Peaky Blinders fan, number one. I just think Killian Murphy's just an amazing actor. I watched a fascinating show out of Korea, so I won't bore you with the details, but it was a North Korea, South Korea espionage thriller with subtitles so I could follow the plot. But what I love doing is using streaming to sort of get into other cultures that traditional broadcast media wouldn't expose me to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. What is the best part of your morning routine? The early hours. I'm a pretty early riser and chaos hasn't started yet in my day. You know, a lot of consulting is how high when the customer asks you to jump. And so you're you're doing multiple projects at the same time. And there's usually surprises during the day that to deliver quality work, you've got to be pretty darn agile. But the early morning is when I get to think, when I get to spend time sort of working through my own goals. So I'd I'd say sort of 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. are the hours that for me are the most memorable because they're a bit more peaceful and a bit more reflective. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's your idea of perfect happiness? I'm a musician and I love orchestrating music. 
I, I write music. And so for me being in a digital studio and you get to be the band in a digital world. So you're going to make all the instruments work together and coming up with a sound that you really think, you know, it's a beautiful sound and the lyrics say something. For me, that's probably the closest thing to Nirvana. And if you could have lunch with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? I think I'd go Gandhi. I've always been such a uh, fan of how he handled power and peace. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know he had a dark side to his personal life as well. So there's plenty of skeletons there, my guess is. But I think um, overall, he struck out in a way that was pretty darned pioneering as a as a model. And I, I'd, I'd probably spend time trying to pick his brain. And if you could describe your life in one quick motto, what would it be? Probably do what matters and have fun while you're doing it. Uh, yeah. You know, I think there's something, there's a joy in, there's a joy in tackling a problem or climbing a mountain worth climbing or worth tackling. And it's less about the effort that it takes and more, you know, am I trying to move the needle with what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. So I do a lot of work in microfinance and I find we can create scale impact people living in poverty around the world. If we, if we get our sort of lending systems and saving systems right and make them for small amounts of lens, small amounts of savings so that people can access them who otherwise couldn't access banking services. So I think something that feels like, hey, if I was able to take the skills that I probably developed helping shareholders do better, get richer, mm -hmm. but turn them and then use them to help folks who maybe aren't those shareholders also do better in life. To me, that's the most meaningful thing is to find something worthwhile doing and, and then um, figure out how to do it with people that you respect, which is really where the have fun doing it comes in as well. Well, Ted, it's been really interesting having you on the show and thanks for answering all my questions about customer data and your new book and hopefully you'll come back soon. Thank you, Blake. Would love to and congrats on your podcast. It's a great topic. The Modern Customer is just a great topic. Thank you, everybody. You've been tuning into the Modern Customer Podcast. Thanks for watching and listening until next time. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel or follow me on social media, including Instagram, LinkedIn, X, and more. Mm -hmm.